Um, I'd like to start off by uh, reading the psalm. Psalm 130 we're going to um, talk about this morning. So if you keep your your um, if you keep the page open, 130, we're going to go through it um, verse by verse. So let's read Psalm 130. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in the word I do hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Oh. I'm using this new um, Apple, and I'm an Android guy, so here we go. (laughs) In today's society, um, we feel guilt all the time, don't we? If we eat the last piece of chocolate cake, we feel guilty. If we miss doing our exercise, we feel guilty. If we have a day off work, we feel guilty. If we let people down, we feel guilty. But when it comes to spiritual things, when we sin and we think we've let God down, well, we say to ourselves often, well, am I really a Christian? Well, this is guilt. So how do we deal with this guilt? And one way is by denial. Now, my daughter's family all the boys, they bought, this, uh, they bought motorbikes so they could all bond together. And my grandson crashed his bike. And there's Seth on the ground and the bike in the bushes. My son-in-law said, you were trying to do a mono, weren't you? Now, a mono, if you don't know, is where they lift the bike up and, and go on one wheel. And the bike didn't want to do it. It just flew off. Now, he came up with all the excuses because he's not allowed to do a mono until he admitted to his dad he had, because dad had proof, there was this skid mark where he dropped the clutch, but he never owned the problem. We sometimes simply refuse to admit its existence, don't we? Another way is through rationalisation. We admit that we're guilty, but we immediately blunt the edge of our confession by pointing out all the um, extra circumstances that have conspired to make us who we are. We might blame our parents. We might blame our teachers. We might blame the government. We might blame our genes. We might blame the trauma that we might have had. But we simply point out that everyone else is maybe thinking or doing exactly what we're doing. So we're not that bad. And when we find worse examples than ourselves, so that's even better, isn't it? It makes us look so much better. But this, we also take the spotlight off ourselves, don't we, and put it on someone else, much to our relief. But I want to tell you today there's another way to deal with your guilt. And this way that we're going to talk about gets to the root of things. And like most Baptist pastors, I put it in in an acronym. Admission, confession, hope, and evangelism. Says ache. And since this way is healing, it's God's way, and the Psalm 130 is witness to it. So as we get into the Psalm 130, uh, we can see that we need to ache uh, in front of our Lord. So before that, um, can I pray? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just want to bring 
this congregation to you. Heavenly Father, I want to ask that uh, you may touch them in a special way. Those who may be feeling guilty, those who might need you, those who have never heard of things like this before, that you uh, bring them to their mind and that you convict them. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's look at um, verse 1, shall we? Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. So the first point we need to look at is admit. Admit we have a problem. We see the depths of our despair as someone floundering, full of terror. But what's clear here is that self-help is no answer to the depths of distress. And in the Hebrew meaning here, depths, it refers specifically to be caught in dangerous and deep waters. And I remember as a youth, um, we went to a surf beach when our youth group had an excursion. And uh, it was, the, it was uh, the surf and we were swimming around having fun. But I got caught in a rip, and I swam and I swam, and I could not make any headway. What I didn't realize was how exhausting the waves and the motions were. I realized I was over my head, and every time I tried to come up for air, another wave broke over my head. And I couldn't sort out this whole surf ocean thing. And my pride got in the way, and I was too embarrassed to raise my hand for help, and I didn't want to look like a loser. I could swim, but until I wasn't willing to admit I was in trouble, there was no way I was going to get back to shore, back to the beach. Eventually I asked for help, of course, and the lifesavers came and they swam me back in. So the first is we admit we're in too deep. What has overwhelmed the the psalm writer here is not some sort of external trial or persecution or suffering. Rather, he is overwhelmed by the guilt of his own sin. It's not an earthly way to get out of the pit that he's in. We cannot We cannot save ourselves. We can talk long and hard to family, to friends, to counsellors, and yet the guilt still remains. Man has sought to invent all sorts of methods of either denying the existence of sin or even fooling ourselves into thinking we can deal with the guilt without God. Yet in just watching people, one can tell that the guilt remains unforgiven until God is brought into the solution. So we need to pity the person who thinks he can handle guilt on, on his own. For the more they look inward, the pit only gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Our problem today, especially appreciating a psalm like this one, is that most of us do not have much of an awareness of sin. We live most of our lives with very little awareness of God sometimes. And we need to admit we are a sinner. We need to discover how desperate, how aching our condition is apart from God. We need to ache. So let's look at verse 2. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Here we learn that admitting we are a sinner is when we start crying out to God for help. Some people might look for drugs or alcohol or other devices, but we need to cry out to God. Corrie Ten Boom, who wrote The Hiding Place, was sent to a Nancy, uh, Nazi concentration camp uh, during World War II in Germany for hiding Jews in a home. And she wrote, 
There is no pit so deep that God's love is not deeper still. And that's what we need to remember when the bottom falls out of our life. God is still there. When you cry out to him from the depths, when you ache, he will hear you. Admit that you need him. We need to give up our pride to do that because the next point we need to confess because we can't do it on our own. Verse 3 says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? If you, Lord, other, uh, other translation says, If you, Lord, keep a record of sins, Lord, who can stand? If God should simply keep a track of all our sins, write them all down, and yet refuse to forgive, and then our account would become so lopsided that our punishment would be certain and immediate, wouldn't it? We need to be thankful that our God who exists is a God who is willing to forgive. If God were to keep a tally of all our sins and continue to hold people accountable for all the past sins, even the most godly could not stand before him. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned, all, and fallen short of the glory of God. So what's the answer here? Just like verse 1, it says, we need to cry out to God. We need to cry out to God for mercy. In Luke 18, 13, we read about a tax collector and a Pharisee, and they both go out to pray. The Pharisee not really needing God, where the tax collector cries out and beats his chest, saying, have mercy on me. We need to be like the tax collector. Let's go to verse 4. But there is forgiveness with you, that you may be feared. Other, other translation says that you may serve in reverence. Some of us might not find forgiveness with others, or even, or even our families, or, or some people find it extremely difficult to forgive themselves. What wonderful news this verse gives us, that God is both able and willing to forgive. You see, it is in God's character to forgive. I think verse 4 is the key verse in this psalm. Consider how a godly man reacts to such forgiveness. He doesn't say, oh well, if I sin again, God's going to forgive me. So let's not take sin seriously. I'll just do it again and again because God's going to forgive me. A godly man or woman truly has repented they truly appreciate their forgiveness. And that forgiveness leads to service. That's what that fear is about. True and certain effects of forgiveness are love, worship, and service. Confession is an act of worship. By these effects... You can measure whether you have actually confessed your sin, believed on God and been forgiven. And those who have been forgiven are softened and humbled and overwhelmed by God's mercy. And they determine never to sin again because they fear God. You see, when we truly understand God's forgiveness and the cost of it, the cost is sending Christ to the cross we should be broken and humbled and bow in awe before our God. There's no presumption here. There's no flippancy here. We deserve judgment. Agreed? Yet what do we receive? Mercy. There's another psalm. I don't know if you've been uh, through this one yet, Ray. Psalm 103. 
It says, Praise the Lord, my soul, all my innermost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion? Who satisfies your desires with good things? Then we go down to verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east from the west, so far as he has removed our transgressions from us. It is God's very nature. It is within his character to forgive. If not, why did he not send his only son to die on the cross for us? A famous psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Carl uh, Menninger, once said, if he could convince the patients in the psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them will walk out the door the next day. So we have to admit, we have to confess, and our next one is hope. Verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope, or I put my hope. But match that up with Romans 3, 25 and 26. Romans 3, 25 and 26. It says this, when God set forth as a prohibition by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You see, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be, to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because his forbearance, he had left his sins committed beforehand unpunished. Notice that waiting there is grounded on the promises and the instructions revealed in the scriptures. The Bible tells us that God is merciful, willing to forgive, and explains just how and when we can be forgiven. We admit, we confess because sin is forgiven, and then we have great hope. In the original Hebrew text, the words wait and hope, uh, they overlap meaning, and they're oftentimes synonymous. Uh, the parallelism in verse 4, verse 5, confirms this. The last four verses of this psalm mention hoping, waiting five times, proving it to be the major theme of the psalm's second half. Hoping in the Lord rests on who God is and what he has done. And in this case, the forgiving. Hope flows from knowing and fearing the one who is both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So as instead of rightly condemning us, God condemned Christ in our place so that we could be left spotless and clean in his sight. Without Christ, God can't even look upon us because of our sin. We hope in God because in Christ he is for us. He has brought us out of the darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son. Another way of saying this, in short, he's on our side. Hoping God causes us to forsake all other hopes 
hope in our performance, hope in our abilities, hope in our families, hope in our friends, hope in our future, hope in prospects for a good life, hope in what we do for God, takes away all that guilt, all that guilt that we have. And then we come to verse 6. I better get back to Psalm 130. Verse 6 says, My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning. Yes, more than those who watch for the morning. I used to be a security guard with um, Queensland government. And they were 12-hour shifts. They used to go from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Wow, it was a boring job. Looking at monitors, going for walks around buildings, sometimes uh, hoping something would happen. (laughs) And you know what? You know what I looked for every night? The morning. The morning came every time. The nights were long and still I had to wait for it. But morning came every time. It's a beautiful image, verse 6, isn't it? It presents to us both the sense of longing and waiting, along with the certainty that the morning will arrive. We wait for the Lord and hope in his word because his word confirms his character to us. The promises of his word reveal that we can, I'm not going to change that, we must hope in him. And this hope will start to dawn for us as watchman awaits the sunrise, seeing a glimmer of light at the break of dawn, increasing more and more each moment he waits. When I was a security guard, I used to get... um, I used to try and get the last walk around just as the dawn was breaking. Our hope will be more than out of of the watchman, for our hope rests not in everyday occurrences like the sun rising, something that is enjoyed by men, all men and women, righteous and wicked. Now our hope rests in the grace poured out to those in Christ. Hope of acceptance by a holy God, a new life here on earth, an eternal life, enjoying God's presence in heaven. One thing that this psalm proves is that hope will start to dawn in your life as the gospel takes root in your heart. This Psalm 130 is virtually the gospel. A hope so great cannot contain it, stay contained. It must flow outward. And that's where we come to our next point, evangelism. A-C-H-E, we ache. Psalm 130, verse 7 and 8. I'm going to read them together. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. I believe forgiveness ends with a call to follow, a call to evangelism, a call to evangelize. Admit, confess, hope, and evangelize. Forgiveness is only complete when we call others to the truth and to the experience. So the bottom line is this, that the psalmist knew that this truth couldn't be kept silent. If you are forgiven, are you calling others to know that they too no longer have to wear the guilt, the yoke of sin, that despair? They also can be free from this guilt that they're carrying around. If you aren't, then why not? O Israel, put your hope in the Lord. Taste what I have tasted. 
this is too good to keep it to myself. If you had a cure for cancer, would you share it? Without the Lord, there's no redemption of sins. But with the Lord, there is full redemption. That reality, that is God's desire. It's not just to redeem a few of us, but to redeem the lot of us. He wants to redeem all of us. Do you remember John 3.16? For God so loved the world. Why don't we say it together, shall we? Are you ready? One, two, three. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Do you share the psalmist's hope? Does that hope in the God of the gospel turn your ache to shouts of joy? I'm going to read verse 1 and 2 again. Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. But then I'm going to read verse 7 and 8. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for which the Lord there is mercy, and with him is abundant redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. You see how far the psalmist has come from verse 1 and 2 to verse 7 and 8. For when he started in verse 1 until he finished his song in verse 8, do you rejoice that God will redeem you and all his people from your sins? So my encouragement for you today is to make this psalm your heartfelt prayer. Let these truths pour out from your lips in joyful song to the one who redeems us from our sins. I just want to finish with one verse that I think sums it up. 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, God made him who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's an amazing truth, isn't it? And it's a truth that should cause your heart to ache. The guilt that we had at the beginning of the psalm should be replaced because we are free, free from guilt. But in Galatians 5, it talks about we're free to do what? We're free to serve. Serve one another in love. Now we're free to guilt. We're able to focus on other people and their need for God's mercy. We need to admit our sin, confess, put your hope in him who forgives, and then evangelize and tell others. Tell them about this forgiveness that takes away your guilt. God is as forgiving now as he has ever been. And he will always be the same forgiving God. So I don't know about your heart today. I don't know if God is working this morning. But if he has spoken to you this morning and you want prayer... We're going to have our prayer team up at the front ready for you to pray. Just come up the front as I pray. Or, sorry, Ray's going to um, finish up and, and there's going to be a last song. But I'd like to pray right now for you, right now. 2 Corinthians 5.21, let's pray that prayer. Heavenly Father, we wait in hope that God who made us you who made us, we have no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Heavenly Father, we, we love you and we want to serve you. And Heavenly Father, we ache that we ourselves, will we admit the sin that we have, we confess it to you right now, that we have hope in you, and Heavenly Father, we want to tell others about you. 
We pray we need help for this. It only comes from you. In Jesus' name, amen.